Am I about to read 10 whole books because a fictional character in a Netflix show recommended them? Yes. <laughs> it seems that way. <laughs> Is that a productive use of my time? That's none of your business. Thank you. But let's start with a disclaimer. If you came here because you saw the words sex education in the title of this video and clicked expecting sex advice, you are about to be so, so disappointed, my friend. However, if you, like me, are obsessed with sex education on Netflix, you're in the right place. Because to celebrate the fact that season three is about to drop, I am declaring war on everyone's favorite book nerd, Maeve Wiley. I want to know if her reading recommendations are actually any good or not because throughout the series we regularly see her reading or talking about books. As we learn from this iconic scene she is a fan in particular of complex female characters and I'm excited to read these books. I am here for it. Honestly I don't know if I want to be Maeve Wiley or be with Maeve Wiley but we stand this character and so it's time to see if her reading recommendations are worth our Wiley. Worth our what? Worth I hated it as I said it. Anyway, let's crack on with the first book, which is Othello by William Shakespeare. Okay, this is my favorite Shakespeare play. Othello is a tragedy all about revenge, deception, and miscommunication. Basically, this guy, Othello, gets a military job promotion over another guy called Iago. And Iago is one salty little bitch about it. He is so mad because he believes he has more merit in the field and he deserved a job promotion. The Atlantic Ocean is jealous because of how salty he is. And so, like any rational human being would, Iago decides to deceive Othello into thinking his wife is cheating on him, which she isn't, and it basically results in Othello killing his wife. Spoiler alert, by the way. I mean, it was written 400 years ago. You've had time. But anyway, this play is one of Shakespeare's most accessible because there's not that many characters and the plot is quite easy to follow. So if you are trying to get more into his work, this is a really good entry point. And the characters are so great and the writing is, well, obviously extraordinary. Not me being like, yeah, Shakespeare's okay. I reckon he'll have moderate success. But this play is like an onion. There's layers to this shit because you can read and analyze this play through the lens of race, of gender, of sexuality. There's some really interesting articles about how Iago's behavior may have some homoerotic undertones. And there's this character called Amelia, who is Iago's wife, who makes some cracking observations about gender dynamics. It's really funny. But anyway, Maeve Wiley is a particular fan of Desdemona, who is Othello's wife, because her father forbids her from marrying Othello. But she does not go down without a fight. She pleads her case very articulately and in the end gets what she wants. And for a play and a character written in the early 17th century, she is so subversive and just a total badass. And you may remember that Maeve describes this act as so singular, it is almost transcendental in an essay that she wrote. And while this is true for the time, Desdemona does still operate within the confines of patriarchy. Although she is so self-determined, she never really acquires full autonomy because she basically goes from being the property of her possessive father to being owned by her possessive husband. And she's sort of reified throughout the play, but obviously we're talking about the time. And this was radical to disobey your father and assert authority. But ultimately by the end of the play, it is fragile masculinity that kills her. Shakespeare already said, the men be thy trash. This play is awesome, Desdemona is awesome and we're off to a flying start, so I'll see you in the next book. I do not have words to describe how much I adore this book, and I have a whole degree in using words to describe books. That's how good it is. This is another one of Maeve's favorite books, and this is The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. It is an absolute cult classic, so groundbreaking, so original, so pioneering. And basically we follow a character, Esther Greenwood, as she moves to New York to start an internship at a fashion magazine. And then we observe the deterioration of her mental health. And because the author, Sylvia Plath, battled with her own mental health so much throughout her lifetime, and it's ultimately what killed her, People often read this in a very autobiographical way, but I feel like that's so reductive because there's so much more to this book than just that. Obviously that's incredible, but there's also these vivid, beautiful descriptions of food and fashion and the city. It is so much more multifaceted than people give this book credit for. It is just chef kiss, exquisite. Esther Greenwood definitely fits the bill of a complex female character. She's such a fascinating, interesting protagonist to follow. And this is a great contemporary classic to sink your teeth into. Highly recommend. Honestly, so far, Maeve Wiley's taste is immaculate. I mean, <laughs> she's not actually a real person. I may need to take a step back and just remind myself she isn't real. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I might actually be like losing my mind, but very publicly on the internet. Anyways, you may recall from watching the series that Maeve Wiley's favorite author ever is George Eliot. So I've got two George Eliot books to get to and I'm gonna start reading. 
I just finished reading Silas Marner by George Eliot. You may remember, <laughs> you probably don't, but at one point in series two of Sex Education, we see a close up of Maeve Wiley's nightstand with a bunch of books and this is one of them. And apparently Silas Marner was actually George Eliot's favorite of her own novels. And by apparently, I mean like I just read it on the back of the book. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, it took me a while to get into George Eliot's style of writing because it's so rich and dense. There is a metric shit ton of similes and metaphors packed into this tiny little book. And you really have to be paying attention to appreciate all of the details, which was hard for me because my attention span is the length of a TikTok. So this was hard work, but it was also beautiful. Silas Marner is a great example of realism in literature where they really focus on every minute detail. So the descriptions are so vivid, you feel like you're there. And this book is about a weaver who is a bit of an outcast from society. Interestingly lives away from the town, just like Maeve does, but he one day returns to his home and finds that all of his money, all of his fortune has gone missing. Like my dude had accumulated two whole bags of gold. Now he's living La Vida Broca. I'd be gutted too. And not to mention, he had to leave the previous place he lived in because he was accused of murder so that someone else could steal his wife. So, this guy can't catch a break. You think you're having a bad day? Think about Silas Marner. Jeez. However, his fortunes later change when he adopts a daughter. He finally finds his purpose in life and the town begins to accept him because they love his daughter. And so this is a really interesting study about alienation, changes of fortune, labor, religion, mob mentality, and there's loads of twists and turns, so it is quite a good fast-paced plot. Was it my favorite book? No. Did I enjoy it? Yeah, but finishing this book means that we are now on to the beast itself, Middlemarch. This book is huge. She's a mammoth. I just finally got to the end and I am low-key, actually high-key, exhausted. I am shattered. I need to go and lie down for a couple of days. The text is so small and my eyesight is so bad. So this was a struggle and my big book fear is back with a vengeance. But this book, Middlemarch, is widely considered to be George Eliot's magnum opus, her masterpiece, and it's obviously a really, really impressive piece of fiction. What surprised me most about this is how genuinely witty it is. There are some really funny lines and really sharp remarks that still ring just as true and are just as impactful in today's world. Basically, the concept is we have this fictitious village called Middlemarch, and it's all about the residents of that village. In the lead up to the 1832 Reform Act, which basically implemented huge changes across um, England and Wales, I think, um, on the electoral system. So it gave more men uh, the right to vote. In the book, we have four main plot lines. But the general theme, I would say, that binds them all together is people trying and doing their best and often failing spectacularly. Which is relatable. You know what else is relatable is that in season one and season two, we see Maeve slowly, very slowly, working her way through this book. Like it's taken her two whole seasons and I, I don't think she's finished it yet. That is relatable because this is a long ass book. I imagine that the main character that Maeve Wiley would um, empathize with or understand or appreciate would be Dorothea Brooke, who is this really empowering female protagonist who exhibits so much boldness and high-mindedness. Definitely flawed um, and morally quite immature uh, quite a lot of the time, but she has good intentions, right? And I think Maeve in Sex Education is sort of modeled on that type of a character. I mean, you know, setting up a sex clinic at school to help people with their issues and charging them for it is BDE. Big Dorothea energy. And yeah, I'm gonna go and take a nap for several days. What I will say though, is I've been listening to the Sex Education soundtrack and it's so good. It's like really giving me dangerous levels of main character energy. Like main character syndrome is, uh, is hitting pretty deep right now. And uh, mysteriously reading a George Eliot novel by the Camden Canal doesn't help that. <laughs> I'm gonna be out of control pretty soon. So I will see you when I'm done with another book. Two words. Jane Austen. Jane motherfucking Austen! Of course, Maeve Wiley is a Jane Austen fan. But interestingly, she tells Headmaster Groff that her favorite Jane Austen book is Lady Susan, which she describes as a severely underrated piece of feminist literature. This is a novella, so a short novel, that Austen wrote when she was 19, but it wasn't published until long after her death. And it's not usually really considered as part of her oeuvre or like the Jane Austen cinematic universe. So I'm actually really grateful for this video because otherwise I don't know whether I would have actually got around to reading it. Well, I listened to it as an audiobook because so I couldn't find a physical copy anywhere. It's very different to the rest of her books because it's written in an epistolary fashion, which means that it's written as like a series of letters between characters. And Lady Susan is basically um, a recent widow who seduces and manipulates men, including those who are married. Um, <laughs> she also has a daughter who she's very kind of hostile towards and mostly just ignores. And it's interesting, definitely. Did you?
My freaking plant just fell over. Shitting hell. I can't believe my plant just gave up. It definitely wasn't my favorite Jane Austen book, but I am glad I read it. And the audiobook is available on YouTube for free, and it's quite short, so if you do want to read it, or listen to it, Go do it! But as we saw earlier from her nightstand, Maeve is also a fan of Emma by Jane Austen, which is my favourite Jane Austen book of all time. Emma is a comedy of errors. It's all about misinterpretation, miscommunication, confusion. Actually, it's quite interesting how a lot of these books are about misinterpretation and miscommunication when that's basically Maeve and Otis's relationship. Like, they constantly seem to sort of miss each other. I wonder if that was intentional. But the eponymous character of this book is Emma, which basically means the character who lends their name to the title. And I love this, but basically when Austin wrote Emma, she described her as a heroine whom no one but myself will much like. And it's kind of because she's very self-obsessed and self-satisfying. A bit snobby and sort of plays with people's lives. Come to think of it, Emma and Mr. Knightley's relationship sort of does resemble Maven Otis's in a way, especially because they do end up together, so here's praying for Maven Otis Endgame in season three. I really do feel though like Maeve as a character is written in a way that does sort of resemble characters like Dorothea Brooke and Emma Woodhouse. Very independent and individual and self-determined and flawed but in a lovable kind of way and the more that we watch them the more we begin to understand why they behave in the way that they do. Anyway, Emma is brilliant, Maeve Wiley has taste and I'm enjoying myself a lot. Okay, so I am a big dummy and basically I am currently in the process of moving out of my flat and I packed up all of my books and in the process I accidentally packed up the remaining four books that I read for this video. Um, so that's really annoying. So I can't hold them up. Also, I packed away a lot of my clothes, which is why I currently look like I've got YouTube filming at four work experience of five. So anyway, these next books are some really important and iconic pieces of feminist literature. Firstly, I think it's really important and crucial that we see Maeve reading a diverse range of feminist books because it shows she's thinking about intersectional feminism and not just white feminism. And so the first book is Unaccustomed Earth by Jhumpa Lahiri. This is a collection of short stories all about Indian American women and their variety of experiences. It is so intricate and so complex, so stunning. And she also reads We Should All Be feminists. This is a book we see not only in her caravan, but also um, she has a poster in her locker that says we should all be feminists on it as well. And this comes under the category of like short book, long essay, if that makes sense. It is all about why everyone in the 21st century should consider themselves to be a feminist. Super contemporary, expertly written, and also is targeted at both men and women. Obviously, we should all be feminists, and we should also all read this essay. But if you don't want to read the essay, um, she also did a TED talk where she basically does like an abridged um, summarized version of uh, the book. So you can check that out. I'll leave a link down below if I remember. But it's honestly one of the best pieces of feminist theory that I've ever read. And speaking of which, we also have the OG piece of feminist writing, and that is The Vindication of the Rights of Woman by Mary Wollstonecraft. This was written in the late 18th century and basically argues that women deserve equal rights to education as their male counterparts. And the argument is that if women are educated properly, then they can contribute to society more fruitfully and more helpfully. Wollstonecraft was such a pioneer, such a feminist icon. She actually uh, lived in uh, the area that I live in right now. And fun fact, her daughter was Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. So there you go, talented family. And as you can see here, this is a perfect bedtime reading for Maeve Wiley. Um, she's sleeping next to it and why not? And then finally, we have Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own. This is the book that Jackson reads to try to impress Maeve, and actually has quite a high success rate. Maeve refers to Woolf as the Beyonce of her time in a text, and honestly, I agree. I can't fault that argument. In this essay, I will. But A Room of One's Own basically discusses the lack of female writers in the industry at the time, not because they weren't talented and that there weren't female writers, it's just that they didn't have the opportunity to write. The title comes from the most well-known line of the book, which is, a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. And Wolf basically explores all of this through a fictional character. Her name is Mary, she goes to the British Library and basically realizes that all of female history has been written by men, usually in quite a defamatory kind of way, and so her argument is that women are not at all inherently inferior, but the experiences, education, and opportunities offered to them at the time were inferior to men. So it's a kind of financial, social, educational disadvantage being imposed upon them. And as an example, she proposes, like, what if Shakespeare had a sister called Judith who was just as talented as he was? Judith could have written exactly the same plays and she would never ever have got the recognition, and as a result, we as a society would have lost out and missed out on so much incredible stuff. So as you can 
tell, it's a very interesting piece of feminist literature. It's a banger of an essay. And honestly, Maeve Wiley's big brain energy is just on full display. And of course, Maeve's own story within sex education is very much about her trying to achieve autonomy through financial stability, uh, education, and showcasing her natural ability and intelligence, even though she is so often underestimated. And I think that's what makes her such a special character. So, to conclude, Maeve Wiley is a fantastically written character. We only want the best for her. We only want good things for Maeve Wiley in season three. I love that she's a bookworm. I'm intrigued to see what she'll be reading in series three. She may still be reading Middlemarch, who knows? Here's hoping Maeve Wiley finally finishes Middlemarch in season three of Sex Education. The new series is out on Netflix on the 17th of September. And if you haven't watched it yet, it's this fantastic show all about discovering sex and sexuality. So many really honest and open and candid conversations, making mistakes and just being human. It's such a diverse and really incredible show. I love it. So I'm obsessed. Uh, so obsessed that I literally have filmed this whole video. This is essentially a cry for help. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like if you liked it, if you like, and click that big fat red subscribe button if you'd like to see more from me. I've got tons more book videos on the channel. In the meantime, all the best. Stay in touch. We should all be feminists and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.